It is to those beautiful and wonderful words of life that we turn at this time, as all should every time we're in a Bible class or when a sermon is delivered, to learn more about how to go to heaven. When you think about the Bible as a whole, there's no place that you can turn to it that if you understand what's being said in that place, that will not lead you to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. You know that even when Philip, the evangelist, approached the Ethiopian nobleman and he was reading in Isaiah 53 but didn't understand what the message was. And it says then when Philip came into the chariot, he began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Because Jesus is the very focus of the whole Bible, then one can, if they understand the text where they are, begin with that verse or verses or that text and preach unto everybody Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. I want to pose this question that ought to always be on your mind and my mind. Why is God's will not done? Why is God's will not done? Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Then he goes on in the next verses to give a preview, a word study of the judgment day. Because evidently a lot of people will be in the boat of saying, Lord, Lord. But they did not live their lives in the flesh on earth doing His will. Notice verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Thy name and in Thy name have cast out devils and in Thy name done many wonderful works? Well, they didn't actually do it in His name. If they had done it in His name, they had done it by His authority, and His will would have been done, and they wouldn't have been in this position. What you have here is what they thought they had done. But notice verse 23, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, if they had been doing His will, Jesus wouldn't have told them you've been working iniquity. That proves, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that what they thought they were doing by His name or by His authority was not what he authorized. I do not want to be found in that position. And God tells me I don't have to be. And that's a good thought. But all around us there are people not doing the will of God. And it's not just enough according to Jesus to acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. So I want to ask the question, why is it not done? Well, I think there's four fundamental reasons that the will of the Lord is not done. First of all, people are just ignorant of it. They don't know it. Ignorant is not a bad word. It just says you don't know something about something. And they don't know the Lord's will. So they can't do it. Not intending to do it. Not knowing they're doing it. Not wanting to do it. Another reason is, is because they just don't believe Him. They may read that God said this and this applies to me. They don't really believe Him. How many people acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord? Call Him their Savior. Acknowledge the Bible as the Word of God. And the Father of Christ. Acknowledge all of that. But they don't take Him at His Word. They don't believe Him. You see... The best simple definition of faith is taking the Lord at His word. You can quote to them some passage they don't believe, and they'll just say, well, He didn't mean that. Or I just don't think God is such and such, or whatever. Either way they do it, or whatever excuse they use, they're not doing what the passage says that God expects people to do. So ignorance and unbelief. But then there is another reason. Just old stubbornness. Listen to what Paul said in writing to the church at Rome, addressing Jews and Gentile members of the Lord's church. In Romans 2.5 he wrote, 
But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Hardness and impenitent heart. Thus they determine for whatever reason not to do what they know the Bible to say. Or, or they many times will do it like the next point because these are connected. Ignorance, unbelief, stubbornness. The third is neglect. I fear greatly that neglect is going to be a reason a lot of church members lose their soul. Peter evidently thought so. For those of us in class, it ought to be sharp on our mind. When he said this second epistle, Beloved, I now write unto you in which both I stir up your pure minds a way of remembrance. We can neglect things we know we ought to do. How many members of the church say, I'm going to read my Bible every day to hear God speak to me every day and to be more familiar with the truth of God? But they don't do it. How many people being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, fully honest in the doing of it, have a hard time and may never get it worked out about routinely and with regularity obeying the commandment to assemble with the saints? Neglect. How shall we escape? The writer of Hebrews said to Jewish Christians who were being persecuted and thinking about leaving the New Testament system. How shall we escape? If we neglect, there's our word. If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Hebrews 2, 3. Well, let me put before you again, we're asking why God's will is not done. Remember that Paul said to the young preacher Timothy regarding this, saying of himself, that is, Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus and the persecutor of the Lord's church, he said, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. There's our first two points. Ignorance is one reason. People don't do what God told them to do and the way He told them for the reason. Second one's unbelief. Paul said, I was in both those situations. But when he was enlightened with the truth of the gospel, he wasn't stubborn against it. And he didn't neglect it. But he embraced it with all he was to submit to it and live all the days of his life in obedience to the will of God. So I need to always ask myself, am I ignorant of things because I don't do what's necessary to learn? Am I not believing what I know the Bible says? Am I just being stubborn and living a lifestyle I know that is condemned by the Bible? Or engaging in a sin or two? You know, it's not that many. I, I do a whole lot more good than I do evil. Or just neglecting, just leaving undone what I know I ought to do and it would be better for me spiritually to do and I just don't do it. Well, I suggest to you, if you're going to be faithful in the Lord's church, well, even to become a member of the church, a Christian, that you'll have to deal with these. That everybody that has become a Christian has dealt with them and everybody that remains faithful to the Lord deals with them all the time. It's a never-ending process. One grows and develops as a Christian, and in growing and developing, they'll have to deal with ignorance, unbelief, stubbornness, and neglect. So I ask the question, why are men ignorant? Well, of course, a lot of people just haven't been taught. Some people put themselves in a position where they won't have to be taught because, you know, ignorance is bliss. And they think that if they can stay ignorant, even though they have the opportunity to know and to learn, that they'll be all right. In John 6, 45, the scripture reads, It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Well, of course, that takes in consideration the hungering and thirsting after righteousness of that man and the honesty of heart to embrace the truth he's learned. You find again, as I make reference, or as I made reference to it in the beginning, the matter of the Ethiopian eunuch. Look at his idea. He's trying to figure this out on his own, but he doesn't have the wherewithal to do it. He knows he needs somebody that knows more than he does. 
And I think sometimes there's where some stubbornness falls into it because we don't want to admit somebody might know more than I do. Well, I want to tell you personally, as a preacher in my own Bible study, if I haven't, if I had benefited from what folks who had blazed the trail ahead of me, then I, I don't. There'd be so much I wouldn't know today. And evidently, this was a good attitude of the Ethiopian eunuch. Because when he was asked by Philip, do you understand what you're reading? If you've been like most people, oh, well, certainly I understand it. Of course, you know then that you're leaving yourself open, then will explain it to me, and that's when things get interesting. But he said, how can I except some man should guide me? Well, we're not about to admit that I need guidance of somebody else. That knocks at our old good independent American pride that I need help from somebody else. But he desired, Philip, the scripture says, that he would come up and sit with him, Acts 8.31. Have you ever noticed how many times the Lord in dealing with people in his earthly ministry just simply said things and did things to see? Now, just how interested are you? Sometimes he found out they weren't interested at all. And when he did, he left them alone. Then there are those who are deceived. You read of these in 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. Being deceived means, now I know that's not the truth, but it sure sounds good to me. Uh, you know, old patent medicine salesmen and Car salesmen sometimes, we used to say used car salesmen today. Even um, African witch doctors or witch doctors from New Guinea or somewhere, they're all peddling stuff in such a way as to get you to believe what probably they know very well is not true. But they may be deceived themselves. Why, well, our greatest danger is ourselves. Listen to this. First Timothy four or two four, Paul said to Timothy, Who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth? And he was speaking that, speaking in this words about even the leaders of the country. You know, <laughs> we get so hard after people and they deserve it by their ungodly lifestyles. Sometimes we fail to realize that God would have president and his whole staff and family saved every senator and his wife and family to be saved members of the lord's church every congressman every supreme court justice every federal judge every mayor of every town and city and all the city council and all the state government and governors he'd have every one of them to be saved now if he would then what about the spiritual body of christ who is saved should we not also have that same attitude so let's remember that when we're striving to expose error, moral error or whatever it is, that we don't get to a point where we really wish they were in hell burning. That just won't work. That just won't work. Not to have the Christian attitude, the attitude of God, the attitude of Christ, for he died to save all. So as we oppose error, let us oppose it with the desire that we want the person committing the error to be saved, not to be lost. A lot of people refused to know. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, Paul says, of the Gentiles leaving God. And it says because of that, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Romans 1 and verse 28. Now all of this has to do with the person outside of Christ for the most part. And why God's will is not done by them in order to become Christians, members of the Lord's church. But I said earlier that all of these have to do with what we will face in growing and developing to become more like Christ all the days of our life. Let us not be found to where we cultivate the very things that hinders us from knowing God's will and doing God's will. Because it's not just enough to know it. It's a matter of fact, you can't do it if you don't know it. But knowing it is not enough. It's the doing of it that makes the difference. That is the sign of your faithfulness. Remember James chapter 2. Faith without works is dead being alone. Of course, there are those people that just don't study the Bible. I don't know what to say to people like that who all the time are claiming to be godly people. But they don't study it. It shows up on them pretty fast in discussions and in classes and so forth. They just don't know. And yet we're taught in 2 Timothy 2.15 to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we know, and how many times have we heard it quoted and referenced 
such as Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We could say it this way, because of their ignorance. They're destroyed because of their ignorance. Now, it may be they haven't been taught and they haven't had the opportunity. Maybe they have the opportunity and they don't want to know. That's a dangerous thing indeed. But leaving the matter of ignorance, why do not all people believe in Jesus Christ the way it's described in James chapter 2? A living, obedient faith. Well, first of all, you can't get them to even acknowledge the evidence, the credible evidence, credible witnesses and adequate evidence of the scriptures that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Messiah. Then you may have people that just will not render obedience to His will, thus their faith is a dead faith. I know that we have adequate evidence. Jesus Himself said, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me, listen, for the very work's sake, John 14, 11. John closed out his book, John chapter 20, 30 and 31, which I think most of us know that. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The evidence is there. We in the church in preaching the gospel must preach that evidence. It is what will form confidence or faith or belief or trust in Christ Jesus. Some people just don't take the time to consider much of anything but the here and now and what they are interested in regarding their own family and their flesh and their business and so forth. Well, that was typical of Israel of old. The great messianic prophet living some 750 years before Jesus Christ walked this earth the great Isaiah in chapter 1 and 3, beginning that book, said, Of Israel, the ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people doth not consider. But they above all because of who they are. Now they got to where they are. Ought to know and ought to understand. Well, we've mentioned this a lot of times, but it's still so true. People just will not be honest with God, the Bible, and themselves. In Luke 8, 15, the seed of the kingdom is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. It's sown in certain soils. Each soil, according, is, represents a certain part, a certain mind, a certain state of mind or attitude. And it's said of this, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Patience there is the idea they keep doing what they know is right even when it's hard to do it. When they have to bear up under it. When they keep doing things because it's the right thing to do and they will not stop doing right no matter what they receive as a consequence here on this earth and the doing of it. There are those people who don't love the truth. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 You can't be saved if you do not love the truth of the gospel, for the gospel is God's power to save us, Romans 1.16. Now I'd like to think that people understood that the longer they live in the Lord, the longer they grow in knowledge and practice of the truth, the more they're going to love it. I, I'd like to think in my many years of service that I love it now a lot more than I did even as a young preacher. To me, that's what it means to grow in the likeness of Christ, to become more dedicated to the spiritual. And we're talking about what it means to be spiritual on Sunday afternoon, which to a great many people is they're just wrong in their concept of that. But the more I love the truth, the more time I'll spend with it, the more I want to preach it, the more I want to deal with it. It's a way of measuring ourselves as to whether we really are what we ought to be. And many are, as I said earlier, deceived. They just believe contrary to the truth for whatever reason. And that reason is in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. The God of this world. Well, he's anchored in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's the way people, most people live. 
Thus, they can't see the revelation of God's will. They can't see the truth of the Bible. They're too interested in here and now. And when sometimes they want to appear as if they're as knowledgeable of the Bible as other people and refer to a book of the Bible, and they say, 2 Corinthians. If that caused you to think of somebody, I hope. Now, let me tell you, it's not a pretend, folks. You better know what you're talking about. 2 Corinthians. Have mercy. But I fear... Lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. 2 Corinthians 11 and 3. You know, most people who know their ignoramus when it comes to the Bible just don't touch it. <laughs> they just leave it alone. But some people are such ignoramuses. They're trying to show they know something when they don't. They prove further they are ignoramuses. Then there are those, and this really gets our age, folks. They trust in their feelings. We're in a touchy-feely generation. Have you noticed on Facebook how many people say, I'm in need of a hug? Tell me what on the face of the earth a message on Facebook is going to do for you to get a hug. Are they going to do it electronically? I see lots of things posted on social media that makes no sense whatsoever. It's just an emotional statement. I got up this morning, maybe they didn't get their coffee or something. I don't know. And they've got to have somebody just, you know, squeeze them. Well, that might be all right for a husband and a wife and parents of children, children of parents. But I've never been a huggy huggy. I, I, not with anybody now, understand that. I believe in hugs. Believe in kisses. Have no problem with that. But not just anybody that walks up to me. They're more likely, unless I know I'm going to get a stiff hand. At one time in a congregation, there, and, I, and, and this I still remember it, I can see it right now. This woman was going to hug me. She was going to hug me no matter what. Right in the great gulf between the aisles right here. Now, there's nothing automatically sinful in anybody hugging. But this woman didn't hug. She smothered you. I don't like that. Somebody come up and give me a little put around their shoulders or something like that. But when somebody's going to rub all over me, that's trouble. And if Jody had been there, there'd be a bigger trouble than I could have given <laughs> Folks, there's something wrong with us when we don't understand some things like that. So this woman got the stiff arm. She never got any closer than that. Brethren, where's the common sense that goes up here? How do I know I need to obey the gospel? I have obeyed the gospel. How do I know I'm faithful in the church? How do I know I'm not faithful? How do I know that I'm living like the Lord is pleased with me? That He is pleased with me. Well, it won't be by feelings. It won't be by feelings. It'll be my knowledge of the truth that I'm practicing it in my life with the right attitude. Feelings can't, and we're not going to go back into that, but feelings can't prove anything. Let me give you a good example in the Old Testament. Remember that was written four times for our learning that we through patience and comfort the Scriptures from the Scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4. Do you remember poor old Jacob? you remember Joseph? you remember the hatred of his brothers for Joseph? you remember the coat of many colors? you remember how that they... One of the brothers wanted to kill Joseph. Another one talked him out of it. And they sold him into slavery. But they had to tell Daddy. And they weren't about to tell him we sold our younger brother into slavery. So they did another wonderful thing. They said a wild beast has killed him. And they tore his coat of many colors, put goat blood on it, and brought it to him. I said, here it is. Have you ever read about Jacob? Jacob had all the emotions of a father who had lost a son. But was he dead? But the emotions were there. 
But was he dead? No. How are they going to find out whether he was dead or not? You're going to have to be able to find out the evidence that said he's dead or he said he's not. And that took a while, didn't it? Took a long time down the road. And all those years, Jacob thought his boy, his special boy, was dead. But he wasn't. If you go on your feelings altogether or deceive yourself by believing a lie, what appeared to be evidence wasn't, then you may have all the feelings that something is this way or another. You may think you're saved and rejoice that you're saved. But if you haven't obeyed the gospel, you're not saved no matter how you feel. We've got to study the Word of God and act upon, out of an honest heart, the truth that we read. If you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now God said that through Jesus Christ. Do you think He's then given us His Word in such a way as it's next to impossible to learn what to do to be saved? God wants us to be saved. Paul declared then. Morris Hill in his sermon, he's not far from any one of us. God wants to be found, but we're free moral agents. He wants us to will to find him. Why are people stubborn? <laughs> if you want to be a philosopher, there's a good place to start. Why are people stubborn, bullheaded? Or if you're a female, cowheaded, it's the way. Why are you stubborn? We're creatures of choice. We have free will. That's why. And we like doing things our way. We like having things our way. Listen. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. Bolsters. Proud. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Unholy. So Paul wrote to the young preacher, 2 Timothy 3 and 2. Now he needed to know that for his own spiritual well benefit, but as a preacher, he needed to know you're going to deal with people like that when you preach the gospel. You're going to have to deal with them. You're going to have to deal with people and their free will. People don't like to have it pointed out to them that they are transgressing God's will. They don't like it. Self willed people will work it out to where they can keep doing what they want to do, though it's contrary to the Word of God, and feel good in it. Pride is something that is a terrible thing. We use the word pride in a good way today to mean I'm happy for you and I'm glad you accomplished something. But pride is used in the Bible. The vain glory or pride of life is a part of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. Notice what is said in Nehemiah 9.29 concerning the people. And testifiedest against them that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them, and withdrew the shoulder and hardened their neck and would not hear. Would not hear. They chose not to hear. They did what they could do not to hear. In Daniel 15, 20, it is said of Nebuchadnezzar, but when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him the very deceitfulness of sin the lies we believe is what works that way too to build up our pride and cause us to reject and not do the will of God and we're taught but exhort one another daily while it is called today Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3.13, that was said to members of the church. And then one biggie is God delays punishment. In other words, as soon as you sin, that moment you don't die in the sense of physical death. Listen to what it said in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore, what's the result of it? Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully sent, set in them to do evil. One of the reasons that punishment for breaking laws, whatever the punishment might be, in our society doesn't do the good it ought to do and could do is because you can appeal forever. Man's 
not perfect in his laws. Man makes mistakes. But overall, the Jewish prudent system that governs this country is as good as you're going to get. But brethren, let's move it from that to the church of the Lord. Listen to me. When members of the church commit sin, and we play pity patty in the holy water with them for weeks and weeks and weeks on end, why should they think there's going to be a problem? Let me ask parents here who love your children. When you discipline your children, whatever that discipline may be, because they did wrong. They did not do what you said. How long you put up with it? Of course, the modern family may never deal with it. They yell all the time and threaten. But we're talking about a godly family and what parents are there for. Parents are there to rear their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, what about the family of the living God, brothers and sisters in the family? Sin is not something to be trifled with, folks. You see, that's something we've, we've, we've deceived ourselves. A little sin, big sin. Sins that don't really bother the whole church. Where did we learn from God's good word that will judge us on the last day that we ought to deal with members of the church like that? Just let them drag right on. Drag right on. They know nothing's going to happen. So yeah, but we'll do something someday. Do what? Why should they fear anything? You think fear ought to be in a Christian when he sins? Fear toward God and fear what his faithful brethren ought to do? It's something wrong. And you know what we do? We play like some of those folks in politics that we don't like so well. We act just like those folks in Washington we don't like. And I guess it comes right down to where it's a lot easier for me to get on the lectureship circuit and preach against sin and who's going to hell and so forth way out there than it is to look at folks I have to deal with every day and deal with them. But you have to deal with your families every day all day long. And do you discipline them? Well, why do men neglect? Well, I'll give you one reason. But we have other interests. Let's face it. There's some things that are more interesting to me and I like better than doing what the Lord wants me to do. Luke 14, 18 through 20. Then we say, well, there's time enough to change. I've watched that over and over again. People deal with problems in the church as if they have unlimited time in the future to correct it. How much time do you have to correct the sin in your life right now as far as waiting to this afternoon service or Wednesday or somewhere down the road? Do you know you will have that time? Well, again, we've deceived ourselves intellectually and factually. Say, no, I'm not sure of that. But we go ahead and, and live as if we are sure of it. <laughs> then sometimes we're afraid. I, I, it's amazing to me. Matthew 25, 25, the one talent man said, I'm afraid of you. So I just take what you give me and hide it and I give it back to you. I don't do anything with it. Well, we usually talk about the one talent man there, but do you know a ten talent man can be that way too? Or a fifty talent man? Or a five talent man? You can be afraid and just not do what you know the Bible says you ought to do. Would you expect the Lord to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, or maybe well done, thou good and fearful servant, but fearing the wrong thing? Waiting for a more convenient time. Acts 24, 25. Paul preached the word to Felix. And as he preached the word, he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. And Felix did tremble. That's more than we can get some good Americans to do and even some erring church members. And he answered this way, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. I think probably most people that need to obey the gospel, need to repent of sins, have that in their mind as they sit, stand through the singing of a song designed to encourage them to obey the truth and respond to the invitation. Yeah, I need to, but. I need to, but. Or I'll correct this, or I'll get this, or I'll do And it just goes on. Next thing, a year's passed by, and two years, and three years, and here we are. What about the examples, the patterns of other people? The Scripture says, Let us therefore labor into that rest, lest any man fall after the same Example of unbelief. Hebrews 4.11. He's talking about the Hebrew children. The church of the wilderness was a type of the Lord's church. 
You must remember that. Once they cross the Red Sea, they're like us. And what happened to so many of them wandering in the wilderness? The Bible says many of them, he wasn't well pleased. And they died by the thousands. Now that's written for us to understand that once you obey the gospel, that's just the beginning. It's not the end. Remember, we're talking about why God's will is not done. What are the results of all this? Well, just alienation. In Ephesians 4.18, Paul said to the church at Ephesus, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Those are the Gentiles who live so long practicing error. But we have this then said to us, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So as those people were who hadn't obeyed the gospel, the Gentiles that he mentions there in Ephesians 4.18, then in the church we can adopt the same thing. We can fall victim to these things. It takes a lot of vigilance. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Destruction, that's the end of it. Ultimately and finally, eternal destruction. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed. And that without remedy. Proverb 29.1. Now that's in your Bible. What do you think he's telling you? It means when I know what's right and I resist it, then things can come upon me rather rapidly. That's evil and I deserve them because I've known the truth and I put it off. You have the same thing taught in so many places in the Scriptures. We are creatures of choice. We have free will. It's a marvelous thing. God would not be a loving God if He had not given us free will. That meant He had to let us do things, and one of those things was that we sin. We transgress God's law. All of sin comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. You know, God's love had to let us do that. He had to create a world to where we could have the truth and be on His side and pure spiritually. And yet, He had to be such a God, though He loved us, that He would let us choose. And all, at some point in life, choose to violate God's will. We're separated by that sin from God, and we need His love and mercy extended to us only through the gospel to save us. Now, why is, will not, why is God's will not done in your life, in my life, in anybody's life? For the reasons I've given. Now you say, but I think there are other reasons. You find them. You find them, and all there will be is a subcategory to all four of these. So how honest am I of heart? Am I really going to receive with the proper attitude, with meekness, the engrafted word which is able to save my soul or resist it and lose my soul? Whether you're not a Christian or whether you're a child of God, if you're not a Christian, to become a Christian, you'll have to submit to God in loving care for Him and His will to be saved from your sins. But as a child of God, if you're going to become more like Christ, you're going to have to continue to resist all these things. You're going to have to hunger and thirst after righteousness. You're going to have to do His will. You're going to have to follow Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. You're going to have to look at things in the world that are innocent in themselves. But they take you away from doing the Lord's work. And you're going to have to give them up no matter how much you like them. That we don't seem to understand at all. But it's all learning to put first things first. And to be godly. And to have the assurance of eternal glory in heaven. If it's a child of God, you need to repent because you're in sin. You followed one of these courses or a combination of them. We urge you to humble yourself and truly repent of your sins. Come confessing and pray God for forgiveness. Or if you need to obey the gospel, to believe in Christ with all your heart, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of sins with the full resolve that you'll live the rest of your life growing and developing in the likeness of Christ. If you're subject to the Lord's great invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.